Hello, we are doing more tutorial nights. It's very exciting. <laughs> oh yeah, and I'm a little sick by the way, so you're not going to be hearing much from me. Herman's doing a missile tutorial night. Let's get to it. So you want to learn missiles in this game. I don't know how new you are. I'm just going to assume that you're all very new and never built a missile before, or at least are not that... Um, you're still new to building missiles. So we have six types of missiles in Nebulous Public Command. They go from uh, the size one missile all the way to the container, um, which is OSP exclusive, and the hybrid missiles, which are ANS exclusive. So the container is faction locked, and uh, the two hybrid missiles are faction locked. So we'll start with uh, the most basic missile, so we can showcase everything first before going into detail, and that's the uh, size two missile. One second. All right, so let's start with getting familiar with the um, missile editor interface. So up here we got uh, where you can add your name, the color of the missile, and here we have the information on what contributes to the cost of your missile. Uh, here we have um, the missile body with the each and every single socket where you can fit different things. This one, the first one, is the engine. The size of the engine and the warhead socket are dependent on each other. You can regulate the size of the engine uh, at the expense of the warhead and vice versa. So if you want more fuel, uh, you can uh, increase the size of the, of the booster, but it will give you a smaller warhead overall. Down here, you have uh, the information on the avionics. I'll see later the flight characteristics on the missile, which are dependent on the engine, the damage, and then the additional stats that will be modified by um, the missile modules. Um, the most important and probably complex part of missile building is this fucking triangle here. Uh, if you like missiles and want to start um, building missiles, you're gonna have, have to get familiar with this. So. Let's start with a 5 to 5, so 50% ratio on warhead and engine, um, so we can get more round numbers. Uh, the top vertice of the uh, triangle is the top speed of the missile. This is, um, is as fast as your missile is going to go. So the more you go up towards the top, uh, the faster your missile will go. On the right, we have the agility of your missile, the maximum agility wherever you go. So the more you go towards this, the more agile the missile will be. And on the left, we have burn duration, which is for how long your engine will stay on. Uh, burn duration and range are not the same thing. Um, if you see here, if I increase the speed, uh, the range will go up until I go here to the middle. So um, this. This is not equivalent to the range of the missile. It's just for how long the missile will burn its fuel. Um, okay. These three values are dependent on each other in positive and negative ways. Uh, this means you can't have every single uh, value at one time. You can have a balanced way, but you can't have a top speed missile that has the top range and the top maneuverability at the same time. You'll have to make compromises on how you build your missiles. If you want a fast maneuverable missile, you're going to have to go towards this side of the triangle that has both. If you want a, a long range missile that goes fast, you can go towards here and uh, vice versa. So this is basically how this works. You can see it updates in real time when you drag the diamond inside the triangle. Um, you can see your speed and range goes up here and the maneuverability is measured in speed uh, in Gs as well as the acceleration. So it tells you, um, you can basically ignore this and just see in how long uh, your missile reached top speed. Um, the higher the speed and the lower uh, the maneuverability, the longer it will take to get to top speed. And yeah, so your Gs uh, is your value of maneuverability. So the more you go towards zero, the more your Gs increase, and that's the value you're gonna use to determine your um, maneuverability. Another thing to take in note is that the slower your missile will go, the more agile it's going to be, because the turn radius of the missile is going to be um, is going to be smaller. So that's another thing to keep in mind. It's counterintuitive because 
um, maybe you make a missile that's very fast, it has three Gs, and then it turns up to be less maneuverable than something that's very slow, as, uh, slow and only has 1.6 Gs. All right, this is the basics of the triangle. We'll see later some builds, so you can get a hang, uh, like some examples of what to do with this in a certain, depending on the use of the missile. Uh, but for now, um, this is pretty much all the basics. Let's move on to the warheads. So this large socket here houses the warhead. You have four types of warhead. It goes from HE. You have two offensive ones, which are HE and HEKP. And then you have two defensive ones, which are plus fragmentation and plus fragmentation EL. These two don't do damage to ships. So if you wanna, if you want an anti-ship missiles, don't install the fragmentation warheads. They'll do nothing. Okay, I start over with HE. HE is your most basic warhead. It's just an high explosive warhead. Um, it will explode on impact. That's why it's called HEI or HE impact. And upon explosion, it's gonna spawn, um, like from a game design perspective, it spawns some fragments inside the ships, some damage rays. Each damage ray does 50 damage. And um, you'll have as many damage rays, basically, as your damage that you can see down here. Down here, the penetration of the warhead and the damage is showcased. If you see here, if I increase the or decrease the warhead, those values change. So the smaller it is, the less damage and penetration it has. So it will divide this value by uh, by 50, and the number that comes up is going to be the number of damage rays it spawns. <clears throat> What does this mean? I don't know if you know what DT and DR are, so damage reduction and damage uh, thresholds are. I'll assume you don't, but I'll, what this means is that it won't kill reinforced components in ships. So HEI can't do that, it can't kill reinforced components. So usually when you hit a larger ship with HEI, you will damage it a lot, but you won't kill it. This is not a warhead that usually kills lar larger ships. Just damages them a lot, and then you'll, have to, you'll need to um, use guns to clear them up. This is not a problem on smaller ships, because they don't, don't have basically the same health, and they'll, they'll die to HEI just fine. On larger ones, it starts to become a problem. How you can kill ships with HEI is to have enough impacts to trigger crits, so in their like reactor or drives, and those will keep the ship. HEI itself rarely kills ships of a decent size on its own. Now let's see the um, we'll see HEKP later and the blast fragmentation too, because they don't really work on. Um, this type of missile. HEKP is a much more expensive warhead and it's a speed dependent warhead. The penetration of HEKP, since it's a kinetic penetrator, is dependent on the speed of the missile. As you can see, if I decrease the speed, the um, armor penetration goes down. Uh, if I increase the warhead, it goes up too, but it's mostly dependent on speed. Um, you want uh, penetration values on HEKP that are above, uh, like, at least 200 centimeters of armor. So, and you can't really achieve this on any missile that's not a hybrid missile. So don't put HEKP on anything that's not an hybrid. It's not gonna work. <laughs> now let's see the avionics package. This is what guides your missile. Um, it's basically the brain of the missile. You have two kinds, direct and cruise. Direct is free. You have it, it's the cheapest option, of course. And what this does is, um, what you can do with direct guidance missile is position fire your missile like you would a gun, or fire your missile at a target that you have on radar like you would a gun. So it traces a line between you, your ship, and your target, and it will fire the missile along that line. The seeker is activated immediately after launch, um, and, um, this is not doesn't matter if you position fire it or you like uh, put your position fire closer to your ship. The seeker is always on. It always stays on. If you want your seeker to be activated at different distances, you need to cruise, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, another thing that direct does is um, lead. If you're firing on a truck that's moving, um, 
your weapon controller will lead like it will for a gun. So it will measure the, uh, the velocity of the ship and fire the missile mm -hmm. so it intercepts the ships uh, where the ship will be. This is important because it will do it no matter what. So if you're close to a rock, it won't take that into account. Uh, and if you fire something that's in front of you and moving in a direction where um, then the missile where the um, weapon controller will lead, you risk launching your missiles into rocks. So be careful with that. Uh, try to position fire your missiles more than you track fire them. It's much better. If you go here, yeah, you, you have Yonis configuration, and we can see the weapon roll. The weapon roll, uh, there are two modes. There is offensive, which is your standard mode. So uh, the missile will take, uh, you can fire your missile uh, as your main weapon, pretty much. And defensive will fire, automatically fire your missiles at incoming enemy missiles, according to the specifics. That we'll see later for uh, when we build an AMM. Not very important here. Um, for offensive missiles, you shouldn't set them to defensive. Um, but yeah, defensive, an important thing is that defensive missiles don't take up programming channels. They will be fired automatically, and you don't need to worry about that. They're fired immediately. But we'll see that later in more detail. Then we have launch type. Um, launch type, if you go in the voice to text channel, you can see I put there some images of the difference between hot and cold. But basically, cold launch will eject the missile without igniting the engine. And then the thrusters on board the missile will direct it towards um, its target. And then it will ignite the. In the gen it will point the missile in the general direction of the target or the first waypoint and then ignite the engine. Hot launch just launches the missile with its engine on and it will maneuver um, mm -hmm. directly from there with, uh, with its engines on. So it just shoots it out of the, um, of the tube like that. Target lobs behavior um, determines what your missile is going to do when it loses the target. So resume search just means the seeker will stay active and it will keep looking for new targets and self-destruct will just blow up the missile. Blowing up the missile doesn't mean activating the warhead. So if you lose your track and you have an HEI warhead, it won't explode like an HEI. This is not true, not even for the fragmentation ones. So it will just blow up the missile and self-destruct it without activating the warhead. I don't recommend you put your missiles in self-destruct because it's kind of pointless. You, there might be a chance you, uh, chance you reacquire a new target, and that's, given the fact it's free, you might as well do it. Um, OK, then we have terminal maneuvers. And terminal maneuvers is a set of movements your missile will do um, at the end of its flight path towards a target. So when the missile acquires a target, it will do start performing these terminal maneuvers. I'll give you time now to go in the voice to text channel and check that out. Um, check out the images I put there. It shows you the difference in pattern between the two terminal maneuvers, which are weave and corkscrew. Weave costs two points and corkscrew costs three points. When your missile is set on weave, it will just move left and right uh, to avoid PD fire, mostly to avoid 20 millimeter fire. So the defender or the police, that's mostly what you're avoiding here. Um, it does have some effectiveness on flak, um, some very limited effectiveness on um, AMMs, but it's mostly for 20 millimeter. Cold crew does the same as the same effect. It's maybe a bit more effective, and instead of uh, weaving left and right, it just does a spiral towards the target. Note that they both, in both cases, they always straighten up before hitting your target, so that it's a bit easier to hit. But that's the only moment of vulnerability a terminal maneuver missile has, um, depending on since the terminal maneuvers are dependent on the G value, so on your maneuverability and speed, um, then uh, if your missile is maybe not uh, not really maneuverable with course crew, uh, you might miss even weave a bit less, makes you miss a bit less, mm -hmm. but you still maybe miss with weave. So be careful when you tune your engines, uh, test them out, you might miss. <laughs> Um, trajectory preference is only available on direct guidance missiles. So you have minimum angle. Um, what minimum angle does is it traces a line from your ship 
to the target, and the missile will try to align itself with that line. So the yeah, that's pretty much it. If you go in, oh wait, let me send that right now. I forgot to send this image, and this is probably one of the most counterintuitive things. So it's pretty, I like it quite a bit. Uh, yeah, that's basically the difference. Minimum angle will try to pull towards that line that um, the weapons controller draws between you and your target, while free approach doesn't care and just aims directly for the target without doing that extra step. Uh, which one should you use? Uh, this one's kind of up to you. Um, minimum angle is pretty good if you want to hit small targets um, or you're using HEKP. Something like that. Um, but in, at the end of the day, for PD penetration, uh, you should test it on your own, see what you prefer. I personally use uh, minimum angle more than I do free approach, but there are some cases where free approach is pretty good. You just switch it by clicking it, by the way. There is no cost involved. Uh, cruise guidance. Cruise guidance, the only difference is that it doesn't have your uh, trajectory preference. And it costs two points because you can waypoint your missiles by installing quick guidance. So I don't know if you all did the missile tutorial. If you didn't, you should go do the missile tutorial. And um, this is basically what allows you to pay, place down waypoints. Uh, the seeker will activate at the last waypoint. And for everything else, it just behaves exactly like direct guidance. Now let's see the uh, missile modules. Now for this, um, there are images for this in the device to text channel too. Uh, so if you want to take a look, uh, they're there. The first one is called gas bottle. So we talked about additional stats at the start. So we have body integrity, programming time, reader signature, and boost phase. Boost phase is the um, first three seconds of firing a missile, and it's that phase that it's either cold or hot launch. It's basically your, hot, uh, your launch phase. What cold gas bottle does is make the process faster. So the maneuverability of the missile in those first three seconds where you're launching it goes way up. Um, what this means in cold launch is that your missile will maneuver towards that first waypoint or target way quicker and ignite its engine quicker. What this means in hot launch is that your uh, the turn radius for when you launch the missile, so for it to align on target, is going to be way sharper. It's going to be lower. So you risk hitting rocks a bit less. It's pretty good for um, hot launch cold gas bottle. It's pretty good if you're launching like torpedoes inside the enemy PD net, and you need to you need them to get on target pretty quickly. Otherwise, you miss. That's a use for them. Uh, cold gas bottle is one point. Um, it's a very niche, uh, it's not useless like some other, but it's a very niche component. That, uh, yeah, uh, it's great at what it does. Then we have probably the best pen aid module, so the module, um, so penetration aid. This helps you, pen aid modules, which are this, hard skin, and the jammer ones, um, is something that actively helps you penetrate enemy PD networks. The decoy launcher costs 12 points, and what it does is that it deploys three decoys. These decoys um, are, they look like flares. Little, uh, you can see them in the image I posted, and they will be prioritized over your missile. So um, basically means is that uh, when these decoys are deployed, the enemy PD, instead of targeting the missile itself, will target the decoys first and they'll need to destroy them all before they can destroy the missile because they're automatically prioritized. This means that if you have enough decoys on target, they might not even start hitting the missile and you'll get amazing level of penetration with decoy launchers. But they're very expensive. So you can see this is one S2 missile and 17 points for one and we haven't even put in a seeker is a lot. So. This is something you want to use on missiles that are a bit more expensive on their own, like hybrid missiles or torpedoes. Um, something that has a bit more reliability of it or that you really want to hit uh, with. And yeah, this is the decoy launcher. Then there is the ugly brother of the decoy launcher, which is the cluster decoy launcher. 
The only difference between decoy launcher and cluster decoy launcher is the amount of decoys launched, which is double. But the price is 30 instead of uh, 24, which will be double for decoy launcher, which means this is way overpriced and you shouldn't use it because it costs you less to make a new missile pretty much with decoys than to install this module. I can't really find a use for the cluster decoy launcher because it's way too expensive for what it is. I recommend you stay away from it. It's really not a good module. The fast startup module, you can see here. What this does is reduce the time it takes to program your missile. So the delay there is between you issuing the launch order and the missile actually being launched, that's the programming time. This reduces it, for, but also adds a failure rate to your missile of 20%. Failure rate doesn't mean that the missile doesn't launch. The missile will launch anyways, and it will self-destruct out of the tube. So you lose the missile entirely. Fast startup module is very expensive for what it is. There is only a couple of builds you can do with it, but if you're building missiles for the first time, I will stay away from the first up for a fast startup module. It's not that great. You can do the same thing. You can have uh, faster programming times by using either modules that you can get in your ships or compartments. And those are the missile parallel, parallel interface uh, mm -hmm. for modules and the strike planning center for modules. And you have the hardened skin module. This basically just boosts the HP on your missile uh, by 20 points. Uh, this can, is just helpful in the sense that your missile will be more resilient to something like flak. It doesn't really make a difference for 20 millimeter turrets since their DPS is very high, but flak, AMMs, laser PD, all those things will uh, Hardened skin is very useful against. Um, it's pretty expensive, so same rule that applies for decoy launchers applies for this, something that um, you install pen aids on missiles that you really want to hit, and they're going to be way more expensive, and the value of the single missile is going to be way more. And we have radar absorbing coating. This just makes your missile hard, a bit harder to spot. Um, don't expect uh, the absorbing coating to make your missile invisible. It won't. The radar signature is still high enough to be picked up by most radars. So it won't make it invisible. What this really shines um, under is jammers. If you jam and fire uh, coated missiles, they will go up in penetration. Um, they will pen easier and they will be way, way harder to see. But for what it costs, and it's not really that much of an effect. It's, it's not amazing. Uh, it's, it works in what it does, but it's not an amazing pen aid. These two, on the other hand, are pretty good. Self-screening jammer. Uh, this maybe you gotta go look at the picture to see what it is. It's basically a sphere of pretty weak jamming. And this is very helpful to defeat AMMs. Um, so it will create this sphere of jamming of 1,500 meters around your, uh, your missile. And this blinds radar uh, guided AMMs. That's basically the only use you have. If you do get into 1,500 meters of PD, it will jam that too, but the jamming strength is not that high. So the use you'll get out of this is mostly anti-AMM. Uh, the boosted version is different, as you can see it costs double that, and that's because it's not a ball, it's a cone. It's like a jammer uh, that you have on your ship, but it's mounted on your missile. The range is 5,000 meters, as you can see, and it's a way stronger, uh, it's, it's a stronger jamming signal, uh, double as strong as when compared to the self-screening jammer. And this actively jams both AMMs and PD. It jumps PD much better because you have a much better range and a much um, much higher jamming strength. If you have enough self-screening jammer, either they don't see the missile all the time or the PD will be so jammed that it won't engage at all, uh, of course. If the target is isolated, this is especially effective because you can't see the missile. If you have like an offset, so an ally to the side of you that is not getting engaged by the missiles and falls out of the jamming cone, then the effectiveness, on the effectiveness of this goes a bit down because you can still see the missiles and lock them maybe. Um, but it's still pretty good, even with, a, with offset, especially on hybrid missiles. 
And now let's see uh, the secret types. Well, the first secret type is command. Um, command costs 3.5 points, you can see, and um, it's basically a semi-active semi seeker. It's not the semi-active seeker, but it behaves like one. Uh, what does this mean? This means that the missile is not guided autonomously when you use command. When you're using a command guided, uh, when you're using a command seeker, um, the, it's your ship that steers the missile, pretty much. You don't have to do anything, it will do it automatically, but you can't just launch a command missile in a direction and hope it to acquire something. It doesn't work like that. You have to use it almost like you would a gun. So you have your radar truck on a ship and your accuracy is dependent on the quality of the truck. So I recommend you lock your target before firing a command uh, guided missile at it. And then your ship will steer the command, uh, will steer the missile towards it. Um, this means that command is um, communication dependent. If the communication on the missile get jammed or somehow you lose communication with the missile, um, so it's either this, the interruption jammer can jam command missiles or enough uh, of hang up jammers. You probably won't see hang up jammers around much. They're not that good, sadly. Uh, but uh, interruption you can see, especially on command cruisers, um, and those will jam command guided missiles because they block the ship from being able to communicate with the uh, uh, with the missile. If you go on the um, if you go on the voice text channel, uh, you can see a function that command has, and that is um, TRP. So command can be cruised normally, like other type of seekers. Uh, it can only be TRP'd. Uh, TRP is that, uh, let me send the image to, is that basically when you use a command seeker, uh, you can only assign it one waypoint max if you have cruise. Otherwise, you just, uh, otherwise you just use it like a normal uh, direct missile. Um, then we have, uh, Okay. Okay, the terminal distance for command is 4,000 meters. This might, this might not be very intuitive since command doesn't have a cone, but it will start doing terminal maneuvers at 4,000 meters max. Uh, for, the other, um, for the other secret types, they just start doing them uh, upon target detection. Uh, now let's see radar seekers. Radar seekers are the most basic seeker. You have three versions of them and they behave exactly like, um, they behave, um, they see targets the same way you do in your ship. So with radar emissions. They are autonomous seekers, uh, so they have everything on board to make their, uh, to guide themselves and like command. Um, but they're pretty easy, easily defeatable because um, They'll basically track everything apart from like missiles, unless you put the tech small targets on, which allows you to track missiles. I'll see this later with AMMs. Um, so anything in the battle space that has a radar signature, they will track. So that is ships and countermeasures like chaff. So if you fire, um, if you fire a radar guided missile at a certain target they tend to go for the largest radar signature. And that largest radar signature usually is chaff. So they're pretty easy to soft kill. You have three versions of this, the standard one, um, which is 2000 meters range and is fixed. The steerable one, uh, which has the same range as the fixed one, but moves uh, in a circular searching pattern. So your FOV is much larger effectively. And then you have this, which is the steerable extended active radar seeker, which has a 5,000 meter range and does the same movement the steerable active ra uh, radar seeker does. This is exceptional because uh, it's the widest uh, searching uh, seeker we have. So you can scan a pretty significant area with the steerable extended radar seeker. Um, they, work, they all work the same. Um, the only difference is in price. You can see one point, 1.5, and uh, this one has three points. Then we have the fixed semi-active radar seeker. 
Fix and my Active Raider Seekers seek pretty much the same way Active Raider Seekers do, uh, but um, they don't have the, they aren't autonomous in doing this. So the Active Raider Seeker emit their own radar. For the fixed, uh, for the semi active radar seeker, we need to help them out. How do we help them out? With illuminators, which are these two spotlight, floodlight, and OSP. Uh, on OSP, you have the lighthouse illuminator. Um, if you go, there is an image for the semi active radar seeker. You can see that the green cone, that one is the illuminator. So, semi active radar seeker only look for illuminated targets. So they're pretty, they're a bit harder to use in the sense that you have to do two things. You have to launch the missile and then keep the target illuminated. But they have their strengths. The first strength is that this seeker is free. You don't pay for it. Um, you don't pay for the semi-active radar seeker. The second strength is that the, uh, they're less vulnerable to chaff when compared to the um, radar seekers. Since you are designating the target, um, assume, assuming your target is moving, you can keep the illuminator on your target rather than the chaff, and this way it's harder um, for them to be seduced. And another thing that factors in is that at the middle of the illuminator, the signal is stronger. So um, if you take the beam of the illuminator, the more you go inwards, uh, towards the center, the stronger the signal is going to be. And so if you're illuminating a, ships and the sh a ship and the ship is in the middle of the cone, then the seeker tends to go for that one. I haven't mentioned that you can also jam radar seekers as well as you can uh, radar seeker and semi-active seekers with jammers the same way you jam ship sensors. So for example, a blanket jammer does it. Uh, if you're jamming in the direction of the seekers, they will go blind or acquire fake targets, they'll get confused and fly all over the place. But they mostly get blinded. That's one way to soft kill semi-active radar seekers, for example. Then we have anti-radiation seekers, or ARAD. ARAD looks for radar emissions, the same way that ELINT does. ELINT gives us um, um, ELINT gives us like a position or like a direction for um, radar emissions, ARAD seeks the six targets in the same way. So it looks for radar. If you have your radar on, uh, ARAD will look for that, will see you. If you have your jammers on, ARAD will see that and come for you. If you have your FCRs on, ARAD will see that. So for example, a bullseye lock can be detectable by anti-radiation. Um, so if you have your radar on, are locking something or are jamming something within the uh, radar cone, you can be detected by ARAD. How do you soft kill ARAD? You simply turn off everything. So your jammers, um, your radar, your fire control radars, so like bullseye, stop locking, cancel the locking order, and ARAD will be completely blind to you. It can't see you, as long as you're not emitting radiation of any kind. A peculiarity of um, ARAD is that it, uh, it prefers um, it prefers jamming, uh, jamming signals over uh, radar signals. And they it will pick them up outside this range of 3,000 meters. If you jam uh, a red seeker, it will come for you. It will come for the jammer. It will seek it, even if it's outside of the 3,000 meter range. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, what you can do with this is either lure it away from other targets using jammers. Or in case of an hybrid, try to trigger the stage, the sprint stage earlier so that it runs out of fuel before it hits you. Or just to turn off your jammer if they're firing ARAD at you. ARAD has two modes, uh, the one we talked about, which is all the radar, and then just jamming, which is just the jamming part we just talked about. So it won't seek for normal radar, just for jamming. And since it's a, it's a bit of a more niche use, it costs less. It's only one point. Sorry, 0 0.5 points. Uh, then we have the last real seeker is the electro-optical seeker. So EO is the most expensive of them all. It's eight points as a base cost. Uh, it costs this much because this is basically a camera. 
is what it is. It can't be jammed by radar jamming. It can't be chaffed. Um, none of that. The only way to jam it is if you're on OSP and have access to um, blackjack laser dazzler. Let me send dazzler. Sorry. Let me send a picture of it. If you don't know what that is. All right, just sent it. That's the blackjack. That's the only thing that can soft kill EO, and its only job is to soft kill EO. ANS can't soft kill EO, so don't even try it. It's useless. You can only shot, um, either shoot it down or exploit some of its vulnerabilities. One thing we haven't talked about yet is these stats here. Support uh, like measures position and measures velocity. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, you can see that EO does not measure velocity. What this means is that this missile doesn't lead. Um, other missiles, like um, active radar seekers, do measure velocity. This means that we'll try to strike the target where it's going to be based on its velocity. EO will just trace a line be uh, between the seeker and the target and follow that line no matter of the uh, velocity of the target. So EO is way easier to dodge. That's one thing. Another thing is that EO tracks exactly the same way as uh, radar seeker do, seekers do, exact, uh, except for the fact, of course, they can't be soft killed. But they will fall for, um, they will hit whatever is in the way. If you have a dead ship, friendly dead ship between you and an EO missile, there is a good chance the EO missile will go for the dead ship because it's closer to you, to, uh, to the missile. They'll go for whatever is closer, unless you're firing them directly. But that's a niche case. We I don't think we have to talk about that. Um, I'll mention it briefly. Basically, if you're firing your EO seeker directly at a track and you have intelligence on that track, so you know the type of ship it tells you, like heavy cruiser, then it will prioritize that type of target over others. In practice, this almost never works. It works to an extent not really that well. I wouldn't rely on it. This is just a very good seeker for OSP, for uh, expensive missiles on OSP, since it can't be soft kill. You have that layer of unreliability removed from you. But you pay for it, and you pay for it a lot, eight points. Then you have Wake. Uh, Wake is not really a seeker in itself. It can't really hit targets the same way um, the other seekers we talk about do. Um, Wake doesn't look for ships. It looks for the trail that ships leave. So the engine trail of your main engine, that orange plume, that's the wake that the seeker looks for. So in practice, what this means is that you'll never hit a target with a wake primary seeker. What this is useful for is two things. Uh, one is as a backup. Because you can see that the FOV is pretty wide. If you go take a look at the Im images, uh, I, at the pictures I posted for Wake, you can see it's very, very wide. Short range, but very wide. So what you can do with this is turn another seeker on target. You can have it as a backup seeker to, for example, ARAD. So if you happen to miss a target with your ARAD seeker, but it goes in the range of the Wake seeker, um, it will turn uh, the missile maybe just enough so that ARAD can engage. And remember that the seeker in your primary slot, which is the one all the way to the right, is always the one that gets priority over the other one. So you don't have to worry about missing. If you have a wake secondary, it will never override the primary seeker as long as the primary seeker can see a target. So that's fine. Um, We've covered pretty much every seeker for now. For the, um, the only thing we have to cover now is seeker combinations, and I think that's easier to do um, if we go take a look at practical applications of these seeker combinations. So I think we'll go and do just that. Um, this is a collection I put together of um, practical uses of missiles by ANS. I try to give it uh, as much variety as possible. And it's a good way to showcase uh, the combos and all that good shit. Let's see. Um, let's start with the S2s, since it's what we started talking about. And the first secret combination you'll have to learn, because it's very good. And 
this is wake validation uh, active radar. Wake validation active radar, um, how does it work? So validators are um, Validators are basically a way um, to check uh, the information that your primary seeker acquires uh, and then uh, determine if that's a viable target or not. And the, how the validator does this varies depending on the validator you're using. Um, so for example, for wake validation, uh, it doesn't look for the plume anymore, it just looks if you used your engines and your main engines in the last minute. So if you have a wake validated missile, active radar, don't use any other secret types for wake. You can only use the active radar ones. So that's for fixed, from the fixed one to the semi-active, they all work with wake validation. The other ones, they don't. So just use this for. Um, it works like this. If the target had its engines on in the last minute, the main engines, not the maneuvering ones, just the ones that make you go forwards, basically, then wake validation will approve that target for the primary seeker. You can set if the if you want to accept unvalidated targets or not, or so basically either go for every target, even if it's validated or not, but prefer validated or just go for the validated one. I'll set it to reject because it's more simple. Um, basically the active radar seeker acquires the target. If the target used the engines, like we told, it will get validated and it will only go for that. What this basically translates to is that you can no longer uh, soft kill the active radar seeker in the ways you usually do. So with chaff, active decoys, um, and such. You can still jam it, but that's pretty much the only way. This is a good way to make your active radar seeker resistant to soft kill. Just add a weight validator like this. Validation, reject, or accept. That's on you. Um, it's your personal preference, but uh, it's not really important. It will go for, it's really cheap. It's only one point. Uh, plus the active radar, and you can use it pretty much on every single missile type just fine. It's that universal. It's a very good secret type. The other one that's very common and almost, and probably better, it's more expensive, but it's probably better than active radar wake validated is ARAD ACT. So you have an ARAD primary seeker. That is exactly what we talked about with ARAD, but it's backed up by uh, an active radar seeker. Um, what this does is add a layer of redundancy on your missile. If they do what we told, uh, what we talked about um, in terms of soft killing the ARAD seeker, so turning off their radar, turning off their jamming, turning off their FCRs. Um, if you only have ARAD, then you have no backup, and your missiles missile will basically be, be blind and miss. If you have an active radar backup seeker, then you have something to fall back on. It will activate if the ARAD doesn't see anything and track the target just fine. It still has the same vulnerabilities as the normal active radar seekers, but it's better than not having it. And this also serves another purpose on more expensive missiles. So let's go on S3Hs, for example, the SAC. Uh, this is the most common S3H build now. It's very cheap. Uh, cruise weave is the build. And this uses a steerable extended backup seeker. This has two purposes. The first one is what we talked about with the uh, normal active radar, so that's backup. The other one is that since the range on the steerable extended active radar seeker exceeds the one of the ARAD, this will help it scan for targets, turn the missile on target and stage it. So it directs the missile towards the target with the active radar seeker, and when it's in range, of the ARAD seeker, then uh, the ARAD seeker takes control over the missile and it will prioritize that. Why is it good? Because active radar seeker, uh, anti radiation seekers only go for radar. And usually things that have the radar on are alive. And so ARAD is also good for that, determining, uh, discriminating against dead, ship, uh, dead ships and such, or ships that are still combat capable because they have the radars on. So this is the secret combination. How do I use this secret combinations? Uh, now, an example can be on a scout. Uh, you can have a scout that mounts um, 
soft kill, um, elint, spyglass, good radar, and then uh, missiles to either defend itself or defend certain capture points. So you can see, for example, a shuttle come in the point, you see it early because you have good radar, and you can strike it with your direct guided size two missiles. Um, you can fire one type of each or mix the salvo, so it's one and one. And you have two programming channels and stuff like this, so you fire both at the same time. Another use for this is for size two missiles and INS with the same secret combination type is to make them cruise. The direct ones have this um, engine configurations I use. They're pretty fast, they're agile enough to not be dodged, and they got enough range to be used direct. The crews are completely different because you need way more range since you need to waypoint them, otherwise it's pointless to make them cruise. Still good range, still decent speed, and decent enough maneuverability. You can use them as a backup, a backpack, for example, on a CH, like this one. And have, uh, you can bring quite a few since they're cheap and use them to like smack scouts or cappers. Nothing major, you can't use this against any real combat capable ships because they'll shoot them down, no problem. But it's still pretty good utility to have on a CH. Okay, you can also mount them if you want like on corvettes, always to duel, small stuff. That's mostly the uses you're gonna get out of S2s on ANS. Um, you don't really see massive S2 spam on ANS anymore, like you do on OSP now. And speaking of, let's see how OSP uses the S2 platform. So the secret combos we're talking about, so active wakefall and uh, ARAD active are still true here. ANS does soft kill um, ARAD active a bit more easy because they have access to active decoys, which are the specific soft kill for ARAD and active at the same time. So they're easier to soft kill. Not everybody brings active decoys, they're good too. So it's, it's good to bring a few of these. Um, they're pretty good, especially to kill scouts. But your bulk is probably gonna be something like this. So real heavy load of uh, active radar awake validated. You can also use EO, but it's very expensive. Something like this is an MLS monitor. As you can see, this costs 1000 points. So you can bring three in a fleet and each one of these mounts here launches four size two missiles at the same time. If you have three of these, you can see how your volume of missiles is gonna be very high. And that's mostly how size two missiles on OSP penetrate PD. It's through sheer volume and overwhelming PD that way. This one is the cruise version. So you can waypoint your missiles as has a bulk magazine where it stores around 100 missiles. With three of these in a fleet, you'll have access to, of course, 300. It's a good number of missiles. It's not exceptional, but it's pretty good considering your salvo volume is gonna be pretty high. You have the same concept, only this time it's direct. Now, this is an abomination, people will scream at me, but I wanted to put it on the nose. Uh, you have an illuminator. This does the same job as the active, as the spotlight I showed you before. So it's uh, an illuminator for semi-active radar seekers. Um, and this one is one of the most common builds for semi-active missiles. You can see we have ARAD set to the jamming configuration with a backup or actually the backup here is this, uh, I'll explain you how it works in a sec. With a backup, fixed semi-active radar seeker, which is the one that uses the illumination. So you, you love to illuminate for this. It's a direct only build. Um, we have the backup for this because as we said, fixed uh, semi-active radar seekers can be jammed. It's one of their, maybe their only big vulnerability. Um, so this seeker here, set to jamming, and it's pretty cheap, will um, redirect the missile towards the jamming signal. So you don't lose the missiles. The only way to really soft kill this effectively is to have a jammer ship that is very offset from what you're shooting at, from, from the ship that's getting shot at, and then you can like drag the missiles 
towards you and release so they miss that's pretty much the only way this is a very good missile for the wrecked um, it's very cheap only four points because both of these are cheap options and the thing is it's, it's a lot of micro if you at least for new players to use the illuminator and bring it to bear make sure it illuminates the target that's about it but it's still it's still pretty easy to use this is the same concept as the monitor as the monitor instead of having three monitors you have one liner this is very dangerous if you're new you risk dying pretty easily if you have one ship i never recommend bringing one ship but it's fair to show this because it's pretty common uh, a pretty common osp build so you have eight launchers in total it launching for missiles at a time and two magazines containing two different types of missiles that you can spam this launches this launches 32 missiles at a time and uh, it's set up for crew so you hide this somewhere and you spam missiles pretty much it uses the same combinations and engine setups we saw, be, we saw before for ans pretty much wake validated uh, active radar and arad act this one has the same concept as the monitor no sorry wrong one <laughs> um, this one has the same concept as the monitor so direct fire illuminated semi-active um, missiles way more dangerous to use this than the other LN but as so you can see cost half so you can bring two of these instead of one now let's go over um, size one missiles Size 1 missiles can be used in two ways mainly, as little uh, dogfighting tools on corvettes mostly or shuttles, and as missile defense. You don't have many options for size 1 missiles since they have only one socket. So if you see here, they only have one slot. You can regulate your warhead and there's mostly two builds you can do it's either something like this that is a bit more warhead a short range or something like this that sacrifices warhead for more range and you can use either active radar seekers or command seekers and anything else really isn't worth it using arad s1s is a bit questionable you can do it it's going to cost you quite a bit i recommend you just use active radar since it's cheap especially if you're doing this dogfight thing on cheap covers you can have something like this there's a vls1 on the belly and uh three defenders and go skirmish with other cappers like that you can bring a good numbers they're very cheap the other use you can have out of uh size one missiles is amms let's take a look at amms ans doesn't really use ans amms all that often you'll mostly see them also uh, on osp since you kind of need them to protect yourself against cyber missiles much harder to shoot down so let's take a look at the amms okay this is the most common probably amm type on uh on the usb what we have is um a steerable active radar seeker uh with a plus frag yell warhead and very maneuverable turn right we said we will talk about the defensive setup and this is exactly what we're going to do now um so you can see they're direct guided there is no reason to make them cruise don't make cruise amms it's just going to cost you more and do nothing different uh just keep them to direct so we have weapon roll defensive this means it will be fired automatically on enemy missiles based on um the options we choose here Threat size chooses what type of missile the AMM will be fired at. The green ones are the ones it will be fired at, and the red ones are the ones that will reject. So we have size one missiles, don't fire at those. Size two missiles and three missiles, yes, fire at those. The salvo size is how many AMMs will be launched with a single missile. Salvo size is of two. And the distance priority, I think, is pretty self explanatory. It's basically, um, at what target should the PD control launch the missiles for? So to prioritize the ones nearest to you or the ones that are more far away, far too near and near too far. 
launch type hot, I recommend you hot launch your AMMs, at least on OSP. I will clear the hole quicker and overall give you a faster reaction time. Um, resume search, of course, I already spoke about this. Terminal maneuvers now, you don't need them on AMMs, you're not avoiding anything, and minimum angle is, uh, is your best option for AMMs. Let's talk about the warhead. We haven't talked about these two warheads yet. We have Blast Fragmentation and Blast Fragmentation EL. So Blast Fragmentation is, as you can see, has less armor penetration, less component damage, sorry, the same component damage, um, and a lower radius. Uh, armor penetration, I wouldn't worry too much right now. Um, just know that the reliability of blast fragmentation is 50%, pretty much, uh, while your reliability on EL is 85%. Uh, this means that you, you'll have to roll the dice a bit less, even though you pay more for blast fragmentation EL, especially against hybrids. Um, the blast fragmentation is not reliable at all. Half of your missiles won't really work, so you'll need to fire a lot more. My recommendation is just use these templates. I'll drop them later, and you can take a look at them. And for anti-hybrid use, always use enhanced lethality. It's much better. Uh, just keeps you a lot safer. This is probably your best bet, this AMM here. Really easy to use, it's pretty cheap. You spam it in your ships, and you'll be safe for hybrids. This one is the other version. You'll have to fire, um, use the same concept of reliability. It's way more maneuverable. And as much smaller warhead, the only difference is this uses command, which will pretty much ignore decoys. This suffers from missiles that use hardened skin. Those are pretty rare though. So if you want, you can mix in some of these. If you're worried about missiles that use decoys, this will counter those and you should be fine. Command also doesn't get jammed by um, the jammers we saw before. So like uh, the boostless subscreening jammer we saw before, one jam command, um, unless it jams you, unless they're using a lot and it doesn't really, no, it never jams command. Uh, the only thing that can jam you out of using command AMMs if you, if you can't see the missile at all. So you'll need a great, great level of jamming to make command ineffective. Against these types though, you get rendered ineffective quite easily by jamming, because it's radar. Works the same way as we talked about for effective missile, for offensive missiles, the way you jam it. It's just the missile doing the jamming this time. And this is pretty much it. Uh, AMMs, I think, need a lesson on their own. Uh, it's a pretty, um, pretty complex topic. Let's take a look at torpedoes. Um, Torpedoes are your short-range option for missiles. Uh, they, have, they carry very large warheads. As you can see, the range is not amazing, um, but they deal a lot of damage at short range. They're also pretty, they also have a lot of health. See here, body integrity is 160. Um, and they are pretty, they are quite fast, 270 meters per second, means it's boostable to a pretty, good amount. There are two main types of torpedoes you can use. You can either use like very cheap torpedoes to put on um, ca cap shuttles, for example, not cap shuttles, cap sprinters, for example, to defend yourself against shuttles, and those use the same uh, secret packet, uh, packages we talked about, so wake validated active radar or uh, ARAD primary uh, active secondary. Alternatively, there is always pure command, and that works too. Um, for something cheap, remember this, there is a difference on torpedoes compared to other missiles. The S2 missile doesn't have a coin point increase, no matter what you do. This one has a point increase if you go towards maneuverability. So the more maneuverable is the missile, the more you will pay for it. If you want a torpedo that's very cheap, you don't really need the maneuverability. We'll go over why it's so expensive to get the maneuverability in a second. But if you're doing something cheap, just go like this, give them zero maneuverability, and that's it. If you're using your torpedoes to kill ships, on the other hand, so as an offensive tool, you can use the same secret combinations we talked about, um, including the semi-active one, 
but um, you'll need to uh, up the PD penetration. And there is two ways to do this. You can either increase the maneuverability of the torpedo and give them terminal maneuvers and then fire them in mass. And this will make it so it's really, really hard to stop them with hard kill. So you do something like this, uh, not really, uh, or like this, it's okay. You can give them a good maneuverability, that's probably too little. Uh, and terminal maneuver, they will penetrate PD much easier. Or you can make them very fast and fire them in mass without terminal maneuvers, that's also a way. Or alternatively, you can use, um, you can use, you can do both or just give them decoys. Giving them decoys is probably the easiest way to penetrate PD with torpedoes on uh, targets that have very heavy PD. You can also combine the two things and give them both um, terminal maneuvers and uh, decoys. And this makes it so that torpedoes a short range, this is a very short range to get in, 5,000 meters, it's lower than beam range. Um, that at that range, it's really hard to stop them. So if something comes to torpedo you at those ranges, be ready, because you'll probably fucking die. <laughs> High volumes of torpedoes uh, with decoys especially are not really stoppable by reasonable PD. You'll need almost two fleets if you do it correctly. Um, another way to do it is just cheap shit, as we talked about it, cheap spam. Uh, always works in this game somehow. <laughs> You can have something like this, cost five points, mount it on um, a tag boat like this, have some of these tag boats inside the swarm and guide it with um, illuminators mounted on your jammer ships. If you're doing a swarm, especially with torpedoes, always bring jamming, otherwise you die. Um, the torpedoes we talked about with command and decoys are also very good options on tag blobs like this. Um, maybe a bit less so on ANS worms, but for, for OSP worms, where you have access to the MLS stream that shoots two torpedoes at once, you can have pretty formidable volumes with worms. Uh, yeah, pretty hard to stop. Pretty nasty stuff if you get close. Um, now we've covered all the normal missiles pretty much. Let me show you maybe um, a torpedo build for ANS. Something like this can be a torpedo build for ANS. You have one CL. The other CL doesn't have to be this. It can be a gun CL. So you have an element of, real, uh, of redundancy. If your ambush doesn't go well with the CL, you still have one to lay back on. And you have jamming to cover your approach. Um, and you can use torpedoes like this that are just direct with decoys. They don't cost much for what they are. They do a lot of damage. And OSP doesn't really bring enough PD usually to stop torpedo strikes. Torpedoes program really fast and you can spam them really quickly. So yeah, let me show you how, how fast torpedoes can program and launch. You can see the seeker is command guided. So I'm locking the target and you see the plus and the minus, I can uh, initiate a mixed salvo. I just can regulate however I want of these two. Uh, I have seven channels available to me and I can choose how many missiles of the two types to use in a certain salvo. So I want to use, for example, five good torpedoes and two bad ones in one salvo. I'm firing two salvos. And you can see that the programming time on the torpedo is so fast that you can almost merge two salvos together to be one. Not many missiles left. Oh, this target here doesn't have much deco much PD. Uh, this also showcases how the PD controller will always prioritize decoys over the missile itself. Okay. Was an empty target. <laughs> Don't expect to be killing a lens that easy. 
And now let's go to um, take a look at the hybrid missiles. What time is it? Let me check. Okay, I still got time. <laughs> right, hybrid missiles. Most common builds, how to use them. Um, let's see. What is the most common build I already showed you? It's the SAC. SAC um, hybrid missiles have uh, two, uh, two engines. The first one is the cruise engine that they will use uh, to bring themselves to a target. And then the sprint stage that activates once they get close enough to a target so that they can hit it with a sprint, uh, sprint stage. Your maximum staging range is with the Seeker is 5,000 meters. It's 5,000 meters because the maximum range for the Seeker is 5,000 meters on uh, the Steerable Extended right, uh, Active Radar Seeker. Um, this one, uh, the cruise configuration on the engine, this one here, um, it works exactly like size 2s. There is no point increase whatsoever. Where there is, is the sprint stage. As you can see, this is a very cheap missile. It's only 20 points. Um, because the hybrid missiles are dependent, uh, the cost of the hybrid missile is dependent on the speed, also dependent on the sp speed of the sprint stage. So if I go up in speed, you can see it goes way up in cost, all the way up to 27. You don't really need that kind of speed on hybrid missiles, usually. For something like this that's cheap, 550 meters a second, which is the base speed, is per perfectly fine. Um, on the sprints are also very maneuverable on their own, 16 meters a second, uh, 16 G, sorry, which is perfectly good enough to sustain terminal maneuvers like Weave, that will let you avoid um, 20 millimeter PD. This mounts an HEI warhead because it's cheap, <laughs> and the Seeker package we talked about before. The WAC is the alternative; it's the exact same engine configuration. Um, just the exact same uh, with um, just different seeker package, which is the one we talked about before. Wake validation, active radar. CVAR, uh, before I talk about the CVAR, let me check once. The CVAR is another type of seeker, uses another type of seeker combination that we haven't seen yet. This is command validation. Command validation um, is paired up with active radar as almost every other type of validation. So we have a command validator with stealable extended active radar seeker on reject, um, the same uh, engine type and configuration we've seen on SAC, except this one's direct. On direct missile, I recommend you invest mostly into speed. You want them to get to target as fast as you can. But otherwise, the, um, the sprint stage is just to uh, this slow just to save cost mostly. No terminal maneuvers on this, very cheap missile. Uh, you use validation on command and steerable extended radar seeker. What you can do with this is fire them both on um, tracks like you would with command um, and they will only validate that track. What does this mean? It means that you're choosing a track when you fire them directly, this only works in direct and TRP, by the way, you're choosing a target track um, when, you're, when you're clicking on it, and that's the only target track that will be, get picked up by the steerable extended radar seeker. Every other track will get ignored uh, by the seeker. This works on target tracks that you get from your radar, this works on healing tracks, this works on healing cross fixes, and I think this is one of those I need to show you because it's not really easy. But this is a fleet that makes use of them. Uh, of the plots. first, let's see um, your classic use of this missile. You have three target trucks. And you can choose one um, that's going to be validated by the command seeker. So use this. I choose that's the one I want the missile to hit. Missile I program the missile. Let me. Receiving. 
if I program the missile. Um, and that missile will only seek that particular target. This wouldn't have happened if I was using a normal Arbiter Seeker. They would have gone for the soft kill, because those are higher. Um, these radar signatures here of the soft kill are larger than the ships. The validation makes sure, one, I don't get soft killed, and two, I hit the target I want. This is what it's good for, the CUR. Another thing you can do with this is if I turn every single radar off. Send traffic. Send traffic. Standing by. Send traffic. Awaiting your orders, Commander. Acknowledged. I can use the Elan trucks, those. This works both on lobs and on cross fixes. I can select them, launch a missile towards them, and this will only uh, this will validate um, the ship that is emitting that radar emission, and only that one, no other one, because the thing is set on reject. If you see now, wait a second for it to launch. Should stage immediately. Standing by. You can see it validates it. Even if I can't see it, I can still uh, de designate that track on Eland as a target and strike it. This also works on crossfix. Now I'm a bit close to get crossfix here, and takes will take too long to take it. Now, it's very good if you want to bonk, for example, um, scouts. You get some Eland. Um, you get some Elan going, you find the radar emissions, and then you fire uh, your command validated missiles either from the scout itself or um, from an offset. The only thing you can't do with this is cruiser. Uh, it's a pretty good missile. So where you can you mount, mount this, either on a swarm, like you saw, or um, you can mount them on um, the backpack of a CH. You have some with decoys, some without. You can mix them. And then you have some cruise missiles. So the WAC and the SAC, they're very cheap. They're very good for utility. You can also mount them on the back of a CL if you want to have the missile option for cheap. There's only um, 120 points of missiles. So it's very cheap. Cheap value for size three hybrids. Now let's go and see. Obviously, on the on every single missile I showed uh, missile I showed you here, you can mount whatever single support module you want. It's gonna work uh, if you want to increase your penetration. Decoys are perfectly viable. Uh, self screen boosted self screen jammers are uh, viable. Hardened skin works too. Whatever you want. I personally use decoys on my CRs. I like them that way, and I mix them up. Very good combo. Now let's see the most expensive types of hybrid missiles. Um, the HEKPs. We talked about HEKP earlier, how it's bit dependent. This is a very different warhead from uh, HE Impact. Uh, and you can see the difference in price between the two. So uh, we can see here the penetration on this missile is 514 centimeters and it delivers 4,320 HP damage. How HEKP works, um, it's completely different from HEI. Instead of spawning fragments and exploding an impact, it will penetrate a ship through and through and spawn multiple explosions inside the ship. I think it's easier if we see it. Let's take... Um, same target as before. So what this means is that uh, HEKP does multiple damage instances in one go. The more you penetrate, the more explosions it will spawn, and it will share your damage between uh, those explosions. There is a misconception that over penetrating a target will land will like impact the damage you have on HEKP. It doesn't really matter that much, you'll still dump 40% of your damage uh, into a single explosion at worst, uh, maybe two. The reason you want to hit a target bow to stern with HEKP, which is exactly what we're going to do here, is to distribute that damage along the ship and um, have as much damage as you can in each explosion. Five. 
if you distribute damage along the ship, uh, you'll do you'll have a much greater chance of hitting actual vital components instead of like it being a liner um, from the side where you risk hitting literally nothing and not doing any damage. HEI doesn't have this problem. HCKP kind of needs to be aligned to be worth because you're paying a lot for it. If you don't hit it perfectly, then you kind of wasted the missile either way. This is the reason why HCKP isn't really very cost effective these days. Because OSP ships don't cost much. Now let's see what I mean by multiple explosions. Oh, that was a very bad hit. Standing by. I skill issued myself. Locking Let's redo it. I forgot to lock. <laughs> so is it more lethal than HEI? Yes. Is it way more finicky now it works? Also yes. It's not as reliable. You can see like it actually kills the ship. We did it with HEI too. Uh, it's way more drastic. And there were multiple explosions uh, spawned across, uh, across the ship. Of course, the visual doesn't really translate what's actually happening in game, but I think it's easier to visualize. This is the kind of hit you want to get with HEKP. From the bow to the stern, or from the stern to the bow, it's the same. You need to cover as much distance inside the ship as possible. If you hit with HEKP on the side, you won't do nearly as much damage and you'll waste a missile. HEKP is pretty hard to use. I don't recommend it to new people. Just spam HEI if you want to bring, uh, if you like missiles, bring more missiles. It's, bring more HEI, it's easier. HEKP uh, is very fun, but not really, not really that great anymore. All right, so. For the S3Hs, I'll still show you how you can use HEKP effectively in fleets. So something like this can be a good HEKP carrier. You can still afford escorts. You have a beam, you have a good load of HEI, and a good load of HEKP. But it's still very dangerous because you have one good ship and that's it, and one escort. So you risk dying for free, pretty much. That's the hugest risk you, re you run in running single ship or very valuable shit like, uh, ships like this. So um, if you're new, I wouldn't do this. Something like this might be a, a bit better. Sorry, uh, this, you have, st you still have S3Hs, size three missiles. You can still bring HEKP in a lower number, but you can afford much more utility with other hurls. And you have a good variety of uses too. On CLs, HEKP you can bring just fine in a limited number. Um, if you want to still be able to afford jamming, I wouldn't go over 1,200 points. And you can bring them in pairs with some jammers and have the HEKP to deal with like targets you can't normally deal with uh, as a CL. So that's Ocellos. Um, bow tanking Ocellos is very hard to kill with a CL, and HEKP can help you out with that. Uh, this is the CL we already saw, yeah. And this is a good use of um, torpedoes in cap gaming. You just have very cheap torpedoes, this one here, or ENS, and you mount it in a Corvette. It's a pretty good use of it. Now we have just one more missile to cover, I think, and that is the two missiles, sorry, the S2H, and the containers, size two hybrids. Size two hybrids are pretty hard to design and use, um, mostly because they're pretty niche in their use. I'd say I recommend if you have to use size two hybrids, you use them in a configuration like this. So a seeker that's pretty hard to soft kill that can either be command or uh, I don't know maybe SAH something like this, or the Seekers we already saw are perfectly fine. If you're doing direct stuff, their stage range isn't great, and their damage isn't great. They're not like, they're not um, like size three hybrids in their flexibility. They have way less uses. 
What they have that's special is their speed. They're very fast. They can go up to 3,050 meters a second. That's very fast for a missile uh, in, in, um, in cruise stage. Then you have, uh, they can also go fast in as fast as S3Hs in their uh, sprint stage, but their damage is lackluster. 960 compared to like, it's pretty much um, size two comparable if the size two has a small warhead. And they are pretty unstable, G wise, as you can see. Uh, they're not really easy. <laughs> to design. This is, um, if you're using them, since they're expensive, if I make this like in the same configuration of a sack, let me show you. Like it costs me almost the same. Uh, what is it? Yeah, only four less points and uh, that's a weave, yeah, okay. Only four less points for a fraction of the, a f a fraction of the damage. See, it's not even comparable. So they're not really cost effective in cruise. You can use them in direct to spam them a lot. As you can see the damage, like the price goes way down, even with the speed. Uh, in these configurations, they have pretty good PD penetration. But there is a good reason for that. And that's because um, they can do something that's special. S2Hs in this configuration, and that's dodging flak and defender um, by staging at a certain point, and that's uh, only doable with direct, pretty much. You could do it in cruise, but it's not as reliable and not as cost effective to use cruise as this on these, as I said. And what basically this would do is uh, they approach the target. Um, they approach their target and at, they stage exactly when the enemy PD starts firing. I'll have to show you this, I think. By doing this, um, the PD controller can't tell where they're gonna be. So in their effort to lead, they just miss and you'll hit them. But uh, if, uh, let me show you this. Yeah, Sivar is always reject, by the way. I didn't read that. You don't want to hit anything in your way when you're using CR, so always put it on reject. Otherwise, you lose your most of the capability you have for choosing your target. If you put it on accept, you lose it. It's not like wake file where it can switch. If you acquire something in the way because CR picks it up, then you got a good chance you're not acquiring the target that you actually want to go for. This is what I'm talking about uh, with the S2H. You'll have to tune it to do this. Uh, it's not that hard to do it. This was finally found out by my good friend Hunter and Seeger together, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's pretty ingenious. So you can see they clear it pretty good. Even though that's not that much flak, they still clear the S2Hs don't have that much health. They're pretty weak. All right, now let's cover the container, which is not great <laughs> in the, the moment, in my opinion. <laughs> I love containers, but They're not really new player friendly. So there is two ways you can use containers pretty much. The first one is the classic container liner. And then there is a bit of a new one, which is uh, using them as backpacks for your lens. Let's go over the builds first. So we have, oh, this say decoy container. They're not actually decoy container. <laughs> They're just normal containers. This is your standard container. It uses the same secret package we've talked about uh, before. Um, it's cruise, it's got 20 kilometer range and a good enough speed. It's pretty slow for a container, this one, to be fair. But if you don't want to miss, I recommend going a bit slower and taking a bit more leniency on that to get the Gs so you don't miss. 
this container here is pretty much good for nothing because on its own if you only have cheap containers like this they will get stopped by defenders no matter how many you fire one defender alone can take out like 30 in in a single salvo it's there's not even any competition it's just they're just useless against standard pd what you need to do with these is add a neo seeker because you don't have the space for two because we need to add the decoys so you can't run uh, i wouldn't recommend running any of the other seekers since this is a very expensive missile you might as well invest in it so you can use eo so this can't be soft killed and then uh, decoy launcher so uh, it's hard to shoot down and you eliminate that defender option uh, that defender problem you don't eliminate this is still very defeatable it's just much harder to defeat than normal containers. When you're building a container liner, build it so your with your primary objective in building it will be to have a main load of EO decoy containers. With engine specs and warhead specs, you can do whatever you like. I recommend going with a decent speed and decent range, at least 20 kilometers. Um, 20 kilometers is a good range, at least 18, I'd say, for the EO decoy. Uh, I will then go under that, otherwise, since you're a single hole, moving around is not going to be very uh, recommendable. But always have the EO and always have the decoy as your primary load. You can have a secondary load of uh, normal containers for utility, but keep this as your secondary. Your primary is always going to be your decoy. You can have different type of containers with different penades, not hardened skin. This won't make a difference against um, against uh, Defender. You can have Boosted Self-Screening Jammer as your secondary, um, as another layer, but it's going to be less effective overall than just Decoy Launcher. Gonna be people, people say it's more effective. I personally don't think so. I think spamming more decoys is better. So just have as many programming channels as you can in your container liner. 10 to 12 is perfectly fine. I wouldn't go below that and have EO decoy as your main uh, armament. Container liner, you have different stacks in your launchers and you can bring different utility with it. As you can see, I'm bringing those containers I told you about, uh, plus some decoys, mine containers. Don't put many mine containers, I just bring mine kind of as a meme. And bare minimum DC just to resist missile strikes maybe. And this one doesn't even have a radar. If you want a radar, get a shuttle. Uh, I think it's more value to have your extra programming channel than the radar. You can put your radar on the shuttle with some soft skill too if you want. The other kind is exactly the same. Exactly the same container, just tuned to be direct. Uh, you can have the same exact container as a backpack uh, and mount it as a liner, or you can pay a bit less and have um, a direct type of container, you just pay it less. That's the only difference. Still EO, uh, still decoy, still EO, just a bit faster and direct. Um, as your secondary weapon, you can see this is, oh, 1030, oops. Uh, okay, I went a bit over this. I don't know what I did. My BDMMs. Okay, you can have three of these, as you can see. I recommend you put in a missile programming bus if you want to do a secondary. So you have a salvo size of nine if you're firing all three liners at the same time, if you're bringing three liners with this, since they cost 1,000 points, that's pretty respectable. And with only one, because the liner comes standard with one programming channel, you're not gonna get through much PD. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty much covers containers as a whole. And we've seen most types of uh, missiles that can be fielded. Let's check. Let me check again. Um, let's see maybe another type of fleet you can field for missiles. It's pretty much the golden standard of the missile fleet at the moment. Frigates have the most, um, if you want to do just missiles, this is, I don't recommend you do this if you're new. Don't do just missiles, bring them as utility at first. And then once you get a fill of, fill of it, you can do full missile fleets. Otherwise you risk being useless. 
frigates have um, pretty good tube efficiency for S3H or for size 3s in general. You can bring 20 on each frigate and have a uh, salvo size of 2 on each. If you fire this information, your effective salvo size is 8. I'll show you how to fire information later. And you'll have some spare for some scouts with Illent. Illent is very useful. And these are uh, these also double as capers. You're not completely useless to your team. Missiles used are the classic, SAC, and WAC. How do these two interact? Let's see. This is now we're gonna see mixed salvos. This mixed salvo, active radar, passive wake, validated, and ARAD act. The two we've seen, uh, you can do it on anything, even on OSP. It works perfectly fine, and it's a very strong mix salvo. Let me just deactivate the sources on the enemy side. Standing by. Okay, so you can form up the ships. Copy that. Forming up. Awaiting your orders, Commander. Standing by. Now they're in a formation. If you shift click in a formation. Um, you can open up the volume for all four, uh, the menu for all four ships. As you can see. Go on to weapon, it's going to show you the collective missile load of all ships. And we can do mix salvo just like we did before. One and one. And that's going to issue the same order to all the ships. Why is one and one useful? So we know that to soft kill active radar passive wake, we need to jam it. But to uh, soft kill ARAD act, we need to turn off every single radar emission. Jamming is a radar emission. So, and to soft kill, yes. So basically you can choose to soft kill one type of each. You can't really soft kill both. So firing mixed salvos of these are pretty, very, are really, really hard to soft kill. The mixed salvos of these, you need to choose what you want to soft kill or hard kill both. <laughs> so you can make your choice: either soft kill the sacks and um, risk getting hit by the wax, soft kill the wax and try to hard kill the sacks. Whatever. You can fire them in. Um, you can cruise them like normal. And as you can see, each and every single each ship has received the same firing order. And the position of the waypoint will be relative to uh, the other ships. Now we won't hit these because they're made to stop hybrids, the ships. So. And as you can see, they fire in... Uh, Simultaneously, pretty much. A good mix. Sack, whack. Yeah, there you go. This type of fleets, the, uh, the missile frigates fleets, um, you can mix in different types of panades too. You'll have to sacrifice some of the scouts for that. But you can do it. And with mixed salvos, uh, it becomes very effective very quickly if you mix in some panades with that. Uh, and the launch volumes you can get with these are pretty, pretty, pre uh, are really high. You can get up to five missiles per frigate and have a salvo size of 20. Now, that's a lot of missiles, but it's also like a fourth of your load. So make of this what you will. Try not to go too greedy with your missiles. I think we covered pretty much everything unless you have any questions. Uh, on specific things, something I missed maybe. You can type them in chat. Show people all the TOT containers. Uh, no. <laughs>
All right, as I said as a start, Seeger pointed that out. Seeger, by the way, is who made these missiles here. Really good missiles, he made them. <laughs> Very grateful for that. So we talked at the start why HEI um, isn't good at killing ships, because it can't break uh, reinforced components. It can't kill them, at least on big ships. Uh, it can't break the DT. The reinforced tag makes sure that they can't, uh, that reinforced components don't die uh, in the first damage instance. If I take, for example, our reinforced CIC, we can see there's a damage threshold of 40, so that's the damage it takes to be grayed out, but it also has a reinforced tag. If the damage reduction on the ship is big enough to bring uh, the damage of the missile, the HEI, below the threshold from 50, the damage reduction, by the way, you can see it here, is plus 5%. If I take a solar one, it's 40%. Um, okay. And we have here the damage threshold of the reinforced CIC. Uh, after the damage reduction, damage instance of the HGI, which is always 50 for every ray. So it deals all the damage you see here. It deals the whole 2,900. It's only split between 50. Instances, uh, in, uh, individual damage uh, of 50. So it can't never break this for one. And secondary, uh, Secondly, it has the tag reinforced. Reinforced means that even if the even if you zero the component, the compartment, if you do enough damage to bring it to zero, it will not die. You need another bullet or another uh, another type, uh, a second instance of damage to kill it. If it has the reinforced tag, even if it goes to zero percent, that's the two reasons why you can't kill stuff with HEI on larger ships, and. HEKP, on the other hand, can generate more damage than that. It does more damage per explosion than HEI, and it does multiple instances of explosions when it, uh, multiple instances of damage when it passes through a ship. It's a different type of damage model. That way, it can kill ships on its own. It can kill um, reinforced, um, it can kill high damage thresholds. It doesn't really care. Especially if the if the warhead is big enough, that is. If you do enough damage, it will kill everything, pretty much. But you need to hit. Uh, you don't need overpan, as I said, doesn't really matter. You'll still dump a lot of damage into the ship. If you really want to make worth of the value of HEKP, you need to hit the ship bow on or at an angle where it travels the most distance you can to a ship. You can do that with cruise. Um, by waypointing it, so it will do that. And in HEI with with direct, sorry, um, you well, you can't really do that unless the enemy is looking at you and launching, and you can launch at that moment. You can't really make, you can't turn the missile uh, in direct. So that's that's why HEKP kills and HEI doesn't. I show why yes god works. Let's see one of the instances where HEI, uh, where S2Hs are very good. Uh, Seeger asked. Let's see. This is the surrender CL. This is a build, if you're new, don't run this. For the love of God, you're gonna die for free. Okay? Surrender CL is a missile, is a CL that brings just missiles. Okay? That's it's all armament, it's three thousand points of ship, of a pretty fragile ship. And I don't recommend you run this. If you're new, you're gonna die and you're gonna be pretty useless. <laughs> Bring more ships than a surrender CL. But this demonstrates pretty well what you can do with S2Hs and where S2Hs are good at uh, as opposed because S2Hs are pretty misunderstood. People try to use them like they're S3Hs, but cheaper, and they don't work that way. So let's take, um, I don't know. Let's take a fleet. Uh, I guess this will do, a liner fleet.
If the rays hit multiple components, the damage will be shared between the components that are hit. Ah, splendid. This uses mixed salvo into 5 HEI, 5 HEKP. Seeger is the one who made it, requested to show it, and here it is. One of my favorite ships, so fun. Uh, don't use it. You can see it does the thing to avoid the flak. This particular ship has no flak. We have penetration. The HEI opens up for the HEKP behind it. Behind it. Usually there is a point defense of the chemical type, so that's defender and flak. They will get fooled by the HEIs, and then the HEKP will follow behind it and do the real damage. Standing by. Missile is away. Missile locked. Locking them up. These all use pure command. Let me read the questions while this impacts. Those are the same AMMs I showed you. Usually do a pretty good job. Standing by. Enemy is being locked. And the damage is pretty formidable uh, on these, especially on about to turn. Oh, this one we missed. No, that's okay. Pretty hard to stop considering how many carries. Um, you have 120 missiles on that shit. But it's extremely hard to play. Uh, it's a very good showcasing of what S2Hs can do. Yeah, I think I talked about uh, firing missiles under jamming with the radar absorber coating. Well, the same effect you get out of the panade, um, of the jamming panade, you can get from a ship mounted jammer. Uh, for example, in uh, my outfit of this, that I showed you, I have a blanket on it. Um, since S2Hs have a pretty small radar signature, um, they can be masked pretty easily from a ship if you're jamming it. This is true for every missile. If you're jamming a ship and you fire missiles at it, the general PD penetration of the missile will go up. because. Um, the missiles will probably either be seen too late, or if you have a strong enough jamming signal, you might even jam anti-missile missiles. So AMMs might get jammed if you're jamming strong enough. Now, one blanket isn't enough. You need like four to do that um, at those ranges to do it reliably. Uh, but yeah, jamming helps with your PD penetration. Let me show you. Maybe, okay. While I load this, do you have any other questions? Awaiting orders, Commander. Jamming activated, Commander. Initiating missile launch. Receiving. <laughs> The detection was light, and overall penetration was greater. Let me read some more of these questions. Let's see. Yeah, late interception can cause the MMs to launch too late, as you saw there. Your minimum amount of damage on HEKP is 40%. If you do spawn one explosion, it's going to concentrate that 40% damage in the one explosion. Okay, so that's how it works. If you have more explosions, and uh, the more explosions you spawn, the more you go towards your full damage potential. 
they will get always get split between the total damage will always get split between uh, all the different explosions. The more you travel through a ship, the more explosions you spawn. So that's what you want to do. Yes, yeah, Avar. Oh, that's exactly what happens. You got anything to add or anything? Show the easiest way to waypoint tech P bow to stern hits. Okay, yeah, I can do that. So there's pretty crucial uh, pieces of information you can do when you're using HEKP. Um, you can discern from the map. Receiving. Yes, Commander. Target locked. So right now we don't have intelligence on these targets at all. We only have their position in space. If we have somebody that brings intel in your team or uh, normal CACs do have an amount of intelligence effort, it will take more time to gather this information. An intelligence center is what does it faster. So if you are playing with your friends, try to get somebody to bring at least one intelligence, no, one is fine. One intelligence center per, um, per team comp is very useful for team play. And it don't, not only is it going to help you how to uh, identify the type of ship, as you can see it says unknown now, it's also going to give you um, it's also going to give you more information. For example, now we can see the truck quality. That's not intelligence uh, derived. Let me speed up the process a bit so we get intelligence. Doesn't want to give me intelligence. That's fine. Let me let me grab a fleet of this intelligence. Just fire a regular HEI missile to get in, Dal. Yeah, I know. Uh, I wanted to show them how to um, discern the direction of a ship based on the track on the tack map. I'll just do this. Just replace this intelligence center. Okay, take two. Yeah, if you fire a missile at a ship, you'll get perfect visual on the ship. Once the missile is in visual range of the ship, you'll get, um, you can see it just fine. Ready. Guidance online. You can see we got it. And as soon as the missile gets close, we can see the ship as if it was in visual range. This eventually fades out and you can't see it anymore. But now we can see we have intelligent tracks. We have the name of the ship, the condition, which is not always accurate, and the PD condition. The most important piece of information you have here, if you're using HEKP, is this line here. That shows us the heading of the ship. So where the ship is pointing. If I move the ship, Receiving. Waiting for your orders, Commander. you can see that that direction updates in real time. The, uh, the line with the circle at the end is the uh, velocity vector of the ship. So the direction in which it's moving and up what velocity it's going uh, usually um, the longer it is, the faster it's accelerating. Here on the side, we can see the closing distance of the ship. Minus eight means it's moving um, six meters closer, uh, five now every second. And you can see that that line that determines where um, the ship is pointing updates. 
and you want to know where the ship is pointing if you want to learn about the stern head. And now that it's a stationary, if I go and take Standing by. this, I know it's pointing towards that direction. Uh, what the fuck? It's not working. Oh, I didn't install a cruise XP in this. Okay, fuck. Well, <laughs> let's pretend this is an XP missile and let's just take um, a normal missile. <laughs> You can waypoint yourself around so that you're aligned with the direction of the ship. You can see that white line there is um, aligned with the red line on the ship. So I know I am aligned with that. And then I can use uh, this line here with the circle at the end. If it's yellow, it means you're roughly aligned. If it's white, you mean you're not. It means you're not. At least it's in the seeker cone. That's what it means. Send it that way, and that's going to align itself, um, hopefully align itself by the target, and you can land about to stern strike, knowing where the bow is and where the stern is. Missile stores are low. Yeah, that's yellow as a but it's not cruise. It's direct. How you dodge Sari Sapphire? Okay, for example, this one didn't dodge Sari Sapphire. So how you dodge Sari Sapphire is that you do a pattern like either you do a zigzag pattern with your cruise missile. Maybe this is a bit extreme, but this is a way to do it. There is another way to do it, which is takes a bit more time to plot, but it generally dodges better, which is to just make a triangle. So this. Something like this, you can make a triangle a bit better than I'm doing right now, <laughs> but yeah. Something like this works just fine. As long as you're evading, um, Teresa won't hit you probably. The more you evade, the less probability there is to hit you. So the evasion is, if the Teresa can't predict where you're accelerating or when the, where the missile is gonna be, then it's not gonna hit. It doesn't take much to fool it. Um, the only point where this triangle thing moving in three dimensions, evading in three dimensions in general is good is when you have more than one Sarissa offset from the plane of the missile or you don't know the plane on which the Sarissa is. Because if I do this, it's going to be very effective from above as your um, position is changing a lot. Uh, from the side, the only thing you have to dodge is your uh, difference in acceleration. And that's not much. So if you do the three-dimensional three thing, you're gonna dodge a lot better. It's also gonna take you a lot more time and consume a lot more fuel, but that's trade-offs. If you do a long turn, for example, if you know a Sarissa is in a certain spot, you can afford to like do um, a long turn, something like this. If the Sarissa is far away, changing your velocity even like this, it's good enough. A sharp turn like this also avoids Sarissa pretty well. Waiting orders.
the best way you can do this is just get missling, bring something like a backpack Axford or a CL uh, with a backpack. So you have your missiles, um, you get to learn how to waypoint, uh, but you're not a complete, uh, especially if you play like public lobbies, you're not useless to your team. You still have the guns to fall off, fall on, and you still have your escort ships to fall on. So something like this is probably what you're looking for, or for CLs. Standing by. Something like this, that has utility, I showed you earlier. Gotcha. Five by five. The S2-1 is the cheapest of them all. The S2s are really cheap. And you can get to learn cruise. If you remove the S2Hs from there, the CH is like 1,700 points. You got all the points to bring um, all the escorts you want. Or I can, I did make some starter fleets that make use of something like this. Um, I might link them later in the voice text channel. Actually, let me just post this so you can take a look on how the, at how this is structured. I misclicked. Herman is dead. If you have any more questions, you can type them here. This train's dead, yo. What? Huh? You uh, closed out of the stream. Whoopsie. You can talk, you don't have to type them, you can just ask. Uh, besides EOD, onliners, yes, uh, you can bring decoys, decoy containers, those are really good. Another thing you can bring is uh, SSJ inside an empty container um, and use that as basically an active decoy. Uh, but decoy containers are a bit easier to use. They go a bit lower. Um, they're gonna last you, not longer, but yeah. Now with the update um, on test branch on the beta we have right now, uh, you can go take a look at that. And if you want, rocket containers are a solid uh, backpack option for that. You can also get, uh, I don't know if you saw, uh, if you go in the voice text channel, you can see um, those S2 spam liners, you can half your missile load and mount guns, um, mount guns on it, and that's another type of backpack you can have. If you have two, you have the same launch volume as one liner. It is very expensive, you're gonna bring less missiles, it's gonna be overall less efficient than a full missile build, but if you want like a one or two salvos of S2, you can do it that way and it's perfectly viable. Yeah, sample size is 32. Also, yeah, as Toasty wrote, uh, command decoys uh, works. Torpedo backpack Ocello, I don't know. Your salvo size is not gonna be that great. The standard program, unless you sacrifice on ammunition elevators and such. It's good sidearm, I wouldn't spend too much on it. Yes, so, Seeger is pointing out you need quite a few missiles to pen uh, pen, uh, to pen PD as OSP. You can't really do it like you do it on ANS. Um, why do hybrid backpacks work? Because you don't need many to pen PD. Uh, they're already high penetration against OSP. Um, even three, a salvo size of three, especially if they're penated, they're, they're gonna pen PD pretty reliably too. On OSP, you can't do that. You can't fire three missiles and expect them to pen. That's never gonna happen unless their PD is absolutely dog shit. So you can get around that with multiple liners because in firing them the same way, I showed you how you fire the frigates. So you fire them in formation, you get a salvo size of nine. If you have a missile programming bus, that's why the containers work. Um, with the MLS, you fire 32 missiles at the time because you have eight times two. Those you gotta fire information too. Don't fire it one at the time. Otherwise, 16 missiles 
it's not really enough uh, to penetrate PD like that. 32 is a lot. Um, so yeah, Ocellos with Backpack, not that great, unless you really invest in programming channels. And at that point, you might as well just go full on torpedoes with Ocello. I don't recommend torpedo Ocello, it's pretty hard to play. Um, it's very reliant on the missiles, to be fair. Torpedo Ocello, and it's not that intuitive how you play. You gotta get real close with a ship that costs a lot of money. People are gonna focus you down and try to kill you. It's the same concept between not bringing 3k ships on ANS if you're nice. Cut, sorry. The MLS liner, you mean? Bulk magazines. All the builds are on voice text, uh, are in voice text chat. You can go take a look at those. They're all there. You use bulk magazines because you need a lot of missiles. If you're investing in one liner, you gotta cram as many missiles as you can in that. And magazines have compounding cost. So if you take another uh, reinforced magazine, it usually costs you more. Um, bulk magazines are more fragile, but store more, so yeah. CR lock for what? Let me check. Also, I haven't I forgot to cover the seeker package on direct command. So for, for HEKPs or direct command missiles in general. If you're using HEKP missiles, my recommendation is penate them all. Just put penates on all of them and use the seeker combinations we talked about for crews. So that's active wake, uh aerodact. Perfectly fine. And if you're using command, what you can do is um, using command, ARAD backup. So if they jam you and have enough stage, uh, staging range to actually hit them at a decent range. So if they jam you, the ARAD is gonna stage the missile and guide it towards them, even if you lose track. So command, ARAD, solid missile combination for direct missiles. Another missile combination for direct missiles that's cheaper is uh, command wake. I wouldn't use that on HEKP. It's a bit of a cheaper option. Don't cheap out on HEKPs. It's not gonna pay you back. You're paying a lot for the warhead, pay a lot for the pain penites too. Um, command wake is good for HEI. If you do uh, an HEI weave, uh, command um, wake, wake secondary, command primary, uh, bring the um, the speed all the way down. You'll get a missile that costs you like 17 points. It's pretty big warhead, and it's pretty reliable since it's command. Oh, we can go over that again. I'll quickly show you. So for configuration on hybrid missiles, there is mainly two ways to do it, or two ways I personally prefer for the sprint stage. So if we go over the crew stage, something like this uh, will grant you 185 meters a second. That's pretty fast in crews and 19 kilometers range. That's plenty enough. You can max out on speed. You lose a lot of range and the maneuverability is already dog shit as it is. So be careful with that. Um, maneuverability in crew stage is important for like S2s if you wanna uh, hide them during their cruise stage close to rocks. You don't really need to do that with hybrids. You can do it, of course, with experience, but it's gonna be a lot harder, um, especially because their turn, uh, their Gs in uh, cruise are very low, regardless of what you do. If you want to add maneuverability, you'll go either too slow or too short range. For the stage range, there is the classic cheapest option, which is to bring it all the way down. You can bring it a bit up until you hit 19, 20 points and then bring it down a bit more. That's something you can do. Otherwise you can just do the easy option and just send it all the way down here. And that's perfectly fine. This way you don't pay it much. You do have hybrid speed, still very fast, and you have great range of staging. Stage trigger at 4,770 meters is excellent. It's outside of most 
of pretty much all PD networks but Sarissa and outside of most AMMs range, at least good AMMs. SAC is the same, exact same configuration, CVAR also the same. What you can do in CVAR if you want is do one hack P level of speed, which is to, this is wrong, one sec, okay. Um, on the sprint stage here, you can, uh, for direct guided missiles, let's cover the, um, oh, this is supposed to be cruise, okay. For direct guided missiles, let's cover um, the two types of engine configurations you can use. This one is for what's called an insta stage. You have 1.2 Gs at 175 meters a second. It's still not that slow. You can still fire this directly outside of staging range. Uh, but this will stage pretty quickly if it is inside 4,000 meters. So it's enough, it stages really quickly because it has 1.2 Gs, that's not that much, it's enough. Um, you can also hot launch this if you want, it's gonna stage immediately out the tube. I will not do that, cold launch them, it's better. Um, it's more reliable. Uh, but this is a good way um, to have a missile that stages immediately if you're firing it inside its staging range. For the AKP, Faster missiles, I will go for 700 meters a second. No maneuverability all the way to speed. Still retains a very good range with a very respectable speed. Anything above this is pretty workable for S3Hs. You can do it, but then you run into problems with your terminal maneuvers. You risk missing, you gotta invest into agility, and then your range goes down, your staging range goes down. You either have to sacrifice warhead or make some other kind of compromises for that. The CR, same as SAC, or you can do also same as um, the ACP. You're gonna pay more now, um, way more. Uh, no 10 DC 1 BB. <laughs> Which one? Which S3H? Terminal maneuvers are used on SAC and WAC. They're not used on CVAR because it's cheaper and CVAR makes use of decoys. You can use uh, terminal maneuvers on CVAR. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not going to miss. The only reason this doesn't have terminal maneuvers is because it has the decoys to help it out. Having terminal maneuvers with decoys is something you can do. For ACP, I would avoid it. You get more reliable hits. Um, just does, it's just more predictable how it does it. So, I wouldn't put terminal maneuvers on XP unless you have to. Weave is fine, you can do it. If you have decoys, you, you can skimp on the terminal maneuver, it's fine. Sometimes they will get shot down. Uh, they keep that in mind by 20 millimeter. If you're firing one at a time, they do have the time to clear all the decoys and then shoot down the missile itself. Will the backpack for the Solomon work or is the beam better? Um, missiles on Solomon are not a good idea, in my opinion. If you, with the money you pay for the missiles, you can afford uh, an escort, which is way more value. You're already spending a lot of money on the BB. Uh, try to protect it uh, as much as you can. Don't put missiles on Solomons, it's my, it's my advice. There are some use cases for missiles on Solomons, you probably don't have one. <laughs> it's it's pretty rare. If you yeah, you don't have the programming channels for the missile, you can only fire one at a time. With one you can get three, which is acceptable, but that's like if you're doing a beam BB, that's one less micro reactor or FBA you can have. If you're doing a GAN BB, why bother with missiles to be fair? If you gotta spend that uh that money for um for the missiles and the missile programming bus, you might as well get a beam and an FBI, uh, and that's way more value. You won't bring many missiles. Yeah, also, putting them on an escort frigate is fine too. Don't waste the mount on the BB. And have the free programming channel too. Anything more, or we close this? 
it's up to you guys. I'm staying if you want to ask more questions. Thank you. If you got more questions, uh, nobody has any more. I think we can close this or. Yeah, we seem green to go. Has anybody uh, recorded this or no? Yeah, it's recorded. Yes. Where can I find the recording? It'll be on the YouTube channel Dark Arribus Cast Nebulous. It'll also be posted in the Neb Videos channel on the Discord, and it'll also be added to Not So Lone Wolf's playlist that he keeps of all the Tutorial Night lectures, and that can be found in the Big Pin on new players which is also in the official discord all right then thank you everybody for coming and okay we have another <laughs> let me answer that first a larger socket on hei will increase your damage and uh, armor penetration The damage of the HEI warhead will always be split uh, in 50 damage rays. If the um, if like there is a um, if the number is not perfect, it will add another 50 damage ray. Uh, one clarification: it it will just add the remainder to the damage ray at the last one, so it could end up with like 30 or 42 or something. Oh, it's just the remainder. It's not full 50. Okay. Is it recommended to build missiles with bigger warhead or smaller? Depends what you're doing with the missile. If you're doing like an anti-scout missile, if you want speed over warhead, you can do that. You don't need armor penetration, you don't need more damage. If you're using missiles against like capital ships, going with a size one warhead is not gonna work. You need a warhead that's sufficient enough, so it works, but that's not too big, so it impairs your missile. As you can see, none of these missiles here have warheads that go above six. You can do that, but there's obviously obviously compromises in range and i wouldn't even go too small s3h really can do everything with a size six warhead another type of build let me show you really quickly what you can do is a size seven warhead go all the way down like this on the stage with no pan aids and wake there's a direct guided missile it's gonna work really well it's a classic. The only thing you trade for this is that your stage range is less than your secret range. If you want that, you can do this. And then we have uh, cost the same, just sprints for more time. This, this doesn't really make that much of a difference, not even in damage, to be fair. It's 500 damage. 2,000 damage is more than sufficient. The armor pen on S3Hs doesn't really matter. Um, you have armor pen, even a size one warhead, and pens everything on OSP besides the monitor. But this is pathetic. You're playing, paying 15 points to do less damage than an S1 does. <laughs> so never go below five or four, I'd say. Three is useless, four is too small. Five is already small, but it's workable. And six is probably your best bet for HEI damage and H HEKP2. If you're big MIDI energy, by the way, see, uh, if you go read these comments, are all very accurate and very, yeah, they're all very accurate. Seeger knows missiles really well, so if you read those, that's all true. Bare minimum damage for OSP 1200. If you want to see what that looks like, it's this it's a size 5 warhead, the one I showed you at the start. You can get pretty respectable range. If you want to do a cruise missile, you can get away with four. 960 is way less. You won't pen a Solomon, for example. A Solomon, as um, we saw before. Okay, no, never mind, I guess. Um, 
a Solomon has more armor than 54 centimeters. So you're not going to pan it first go. You'll need more missiles for that. So if you launch one of these at the Solomon and it pans, it won't do any damage. It will just bounce off the armor. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. Yeah, Seeger made pretty much all the missiles I'm showing. <laughs> but he's new. He's a midshipman. Besides point costs, are there any serious downsides to penetration aids like uh, or to terminal maneuvers of the penetration aid? Um, downsides? Well, you can... Corkscrew, for example, might be too expensive. I, I don't really use corkscrew because it costs more than Weave and doesn't really affect penetration too much. Also, corkscrew can make you miss. So if I have to... Um, if I have to recommend one uh, terminal maneuver type, that's a weave. The downsides is like if you use weave or cross crew on missiles that are already penated, you might be overspending because you might not need it. No, that take too much time, Terra. PD should be another tutorial on Terra. I don't know if this was covered already, but do you have like a, what salvo size, like for that classic command weight missile, would you recommend to engage, say, like your average 3K group of bulkers, right? You're not going to penetrate any good uh, group of bulker with that missile. That's like maybe like something that can a knife that can help you out in a fight. But if you're firing those against any competent full fleets, they're gonna shoot them all down if they have decent enough PD. AMMs are the way to defend yourself in OSP. Remember to bring AMMs. Um, the ones I showed you and the ones that are available in the fleet, fi fleet files I posted are all very good. Try to mount those as many as you can, and those do a nice, nice job. Uh, defeating especially these non pen aided missiles. For that, uh, salvo size of three is fine for that if you're using as a as a knife, for example, as a backpack on an Axford. Three is fine. So if you have like a bulker that's alone or the already expanded this is, um, PD, um, PD load, you can lap it with that. Three is fine. Yeah, I did change the VAR. If you want to see the original CVAR, let me show it to you. Should be it. The original one, so you can see the engine tuning is a bit different, just a bit more expensive. It does work better, it's just more expensive. And the tuning on the cruise stage is exactly the same. What would you throw this at? This missile in particular, is this lone bulkers or? Alien tracks mostly. This can penetrate almost everything. You're firing it out six at a time. Uh, unless there is a Zera play, you should be able to penetrate pretty much everything. Uh, OSP fields, even Ocellus. That's six pen aided missiles with HEI. Well, you can use how I use this. Is a fi uh, um, this also was made by Seeger, by the way. And the tactic is you fly high, you pick up Elan trucks, and you fire C wires at those, or you fire at um, radar trucks uh, that. That you have and they can't see you. Uh, that's the main advantage of command validated missiles. The main use of them, uh, that's not really that much uh, that known, is that you can fire them at Eland and they will validate on Eland tracks and cross fixes. So, very good missiles, the command validated ones.
only really effective in direct. You can this uh, can validate if you TRP it in cruise, but that's about it. If you don't if you don't TRP it, this is gonna act just like a normal uh, active radar missile, which is not that great. Warning too close means you're inside the enemy PD network. I already did that, Pepsi. Can we uh, look at the engine for this missile one more time? Sure. They're all posted, by the way. Um, if you go into voice text chat, you can download the fleet file. All the missiles are available there, and all the AMMs too, for both ANS and OSP. Oh. I just want to ask the two questions. So one of the things is that you've got really, really like no focus into maneuverability on the sprint bus, and you've also got a burn duration which really exceeds the requirement for the stage trigger, right? So it's like a little bit more. What are the boundaries that you want to go above, or like how much, how much like uh, sprint time do you normally aim for to get through? I guess like a PD net, and how much, um, uh, how much speed do you normally go for with these things as well. This type of missiles, especially HEI, where it's not speed de dependent, I aim for um, a speed that either gets me through PD uh, or the minimum speed possible. Hybrids go 500 meters a second at minimum speed. That's still very, very fast. For the stage trigger, anything close to 5K on maximum, um, maximum stage on steerable extended is fine. Uh, the more you spend the sprint stage, the harder it is to shoot you down. Um, so that's what factor is it in. So you can see that the sprint is 584 meters, but the trigger is at 4060. So it's close to 5K. Uh, to get it all the way to 5K, I'd need to reduce. I, I can't get it all the way to 5K. You can't. Unless you increase this, I think. Yeah. Unless you increase the fuel amount, you can't get it all the way there. So it's more important to just sprint for as long as possible rather than to sprint as fast as possible if you're using HEI missiles, is what I'm getting at. And the maneuverability seems to not matter as much either. Because your turn rate is your turn rate is 18.4 Gs without investing anything into maneuverability. That's still a lot. They turn pretty fast regardless, hybrids. They need that maneuverability because they go fast. The faster you go, the easier it is to miss. I wouldn't ever exceed 750 meters a second on a hybrid missile that has terminal maneuvers, especially. Uh, the only time where I will do that, if if, if it's, um, um, it's if I'm doing that flak avoidance thing I've showed, uh, so we're accelerating at very fast speeds close to the um, PD engagement area, uh, actually full PD. That's the only really the only cases where I go above 750 meters a second. You have questions? Oh, never mind. And this is for just anti OSP. Would you recommend sprint speeds of like 900 or more for like an anti alliance missile, for example? Yes. You can brute force the Aurora much easier if you go faster. It's a lot seeker for this, because I never played AVA. I actually I was here after the release of OSP, so my experience for anti-alliance is very limited. I'm not the one to ask for that. Uh, about over 750, I don't think you should be able, you should go above 900 to brute force Aurora, and 750 is fine. So between 900 and 750 should be okay. Oh yeah, about that video, uh, <laughs> It's very common. I've created a monster, the double stealth coding thing that doesn't really work anymore. Um, stealth coding used to be more powerful and stacked more appreciably. So under jamming, they used to be almost completely invisible. They still do that. They're very hard to see, but it's not nearly as powerful. Uh, 
really way too expensive to be cost effective. All right, since it's 2.33 a.m. for me, I think I'm pretty much done. Thank you for coming um, and allowing me to rumble about missiles. You enabled me. <laughs> and I think this is all. If you got any more questions, you can uh, ping me in that discussion or shipyard, and I'll answer you there. All right, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Okay. That <coughs> is that. Let's uh let's post this. Something someone made of Herman. Very silly, very funny. He uh man, that was a that was a good one. We've been here for two and a half hours. Jesus fucking Christ. I think ten minutes or fifteen minutes of that is just needs to be cut. It was like I did an introduction and then we sat and waited for people to show up so I wouldn't run my introduction over Herman's start like I have with the past few tutorial nights. <coughs> Pardon, I'm uh, pretty sick right now. So if you heard any coughing during that because I forgot to mute, I'm sorry. Oh, it was good. There are going to be fleets posted. So Missile Night 1 and Missile Night 2 have all the missiles and all the ships that Herman went over in this tutorial night. Missile Night 1 is ANS. Missile Night 2 is OSP. I will have a Google Drive <laughs> link for that down in the description. Yeah. <laughs> this this screen I can't look at the screen without chuckling. There is what else? I wish the fucking like preview thing at the bottom wouldn't show up. I don't know how to make that go away. There we go. Okay. There is Let's see what else this was hosted out of the main discord there will be a link for that in the description we do one of these almost every friday at this point at around uh, 5 or 6 p.m central standard time sometimes it starts a little later sometimes it starts a little earlier but that's that's roughly when we get rolling uh so far we've gone over f the fleet building basics of frontline and backline and Vryn has gone over capital ships. There was also a night where Tuna went over mines, and he recorded that himself and uploaded it, which is great. And tonight we went over missiles, specifically the fleet editor side of missiles. There was a little bit of practical use, but I think like a true um, missiles practical use is going to have to... One second. Okay. It's going to have to come separately. Because it there's just so much. There's so much that goes into missiles. Herman and I were spitballing this earlier. And he so he <laughs> he, he had written up his whole thing. And he was like, Hey Dark, you wanna critique this? Tell me what's what's wrong, what's right, what I need different. And I was like, Oh, you need all the practical stuff of missiles, and then I wrote out another like page of text. And he's like, Well, that's too much <laughs> and he's he's right that needs to be in a separate one hopefully that will be happening next week maybe the week after just anytime soon so uh sorry if there wasn't a whole lot of that, that that's a funnily enough practical use of missiles is a little more advanced than just building them because if you can get them built well just sort of yeeting them at your opponent can get results to a degree practical use is how to get efficient results and how to get reliable results so that's gonna come later bum, bum, bum.
bum, bum. I think that's it. <laughs> I hope you have a good night, dear viewer. And I hope you enjoyed that at least half as much as I did. I was so happy with that. Good night. See you in the battle space.